I've been wrestling with the ideas of the October lull, nocturnal bucks, and cold fronts over the past few weeks, documenting different bucks across multiple properties and digging back through my research from last season. Experts and I have continued to make the bold claim that cold fronts have no real impact on deer movement. But as a bow hunter and what I've seen take place over these last few weeks, I've changed my mind. Let me try to explain why. Let's first step back in time and cover over the brief history of camera trapping and where all these scary catchphrases actually come from. I know that I'm taking a weird turn, but understanding where these ideas started and how they are all so intertwined together is the first step in figuring out what's actually happening here. As hunting moved from necessity to sport in the 19th century, people began noticing that deer became less daylight active during October, and over the years it became a really good campfire story and has been passed on like folklore into the future. One man, completely captivated by wildlife, decided to try something that nobody had ever done before. His name was George Shiraz III, and I actually have his two books published by National Geographic in 1935 and 1936. In his first volume, he displays the first successful flashlight photo ever made of a wild Wild animal. And guess what it was? A white-tailed deer. Honestly, I could make an entire video on George and his books alone, but I'm going to try to keep this ship moving towards the October lull. George was way ahead of his time. Nat Geo even called him the father of wildlife photography. Back in 1889, Shira set his weapons down and decided to turn his focus towards technology, rigging up a crazy system of tripwires and triggers that could remotely fire both a camera and a flash simultaneously. And since this was the 1890s, that flash was literally an explosion of magnesium powder lighting up the night sky. And these photos and George's passion would spark like-minded ideas into the distant future. In the 1980s, there were a few different groups who had started rigging up cheap devices that would tell you whenever something walked by an area. But it took until 1989 for someone to follow in George's footsteps, exactly 100 years later. Cuddyback unveiled its new 35mm film trail camera. They were big, clunky, and worked most of the time, I think. They were beyond expensive and were highly frowned upon initially. Then in the early 2000s, the shift from film cameras to digital made everything easier to use and incrementally more affordable. People began to cave and purchases started surging. This new tool has permanently changed the way that hunters perceive deer, while simultaneously helping validate pre-existing traditional beliefs. With this new technology, hunters could finally see for themselves what was happening. Summer bucks were becoming strictly nocturnal and even vanishing altogether. Publications ran wild with the idea and started adopting the new catchy terms. These are the same terms that you still hear today from expert hunters, biologists, and other leaders in the hunting industry. Hey guys, it's uh, 5 a.m. or so, October 18th, and I think it's supposed to be 70 degrees this morning, so looking forward to that. Let me, let me pull up the weather, though, because I'm, I'm partially sure that it's going to be 81. Yeah, so 81 degrees. Oh, there's a chance of tornadoes. Um, starting around 3 to 4 p.m. with wind gusts into the 40s. Not bad. So the reason I'm heading out this morning is because last night I got pictures of a mature buck at 8.52 p.m. And I have quite a few more images of this deer leading back towards September. He's pretty much always nocturnal. He always has been, even back in velvet. Last night he was walking to the south side of the camera. And based off of what I know about this property, everywhere in this area is essentially impassable. So in theory, he just wrapped the camera and walked in a different direction, or he's bedded out somewhere on this knob. Initially, I'm pulling up to the farm. I could tell the deer were feeling this heat. I normally see a group of five borderline tame does up at the front of this gate, and they were absent that morning. In addition to that, all of the deer I located looked very sedentary, and most were bedded, which helps validate the low belief system. After checking on the other deer, I head in to locate our buck. I'll gladly take credit for being correct in this instance, as he was actually bedded out on the edge of the knob. Interestingly, I've never recorded a buck bedding on this knob. He stays bedded here until 9am, before moving off to the north to reposition his bed out of the sunlight. I tracked him for most of the day, and in the evening a nasty storm came blowing through. At the tail end of the storm, I observed him move out of his bed and feed in a small food plot into the night, and then bed back down around 
8.45 p.m. All in all, he stayed in this small core area, moving around 850-ish yards all day long. Okay, what's actually going on here? A whitetail's body temperature runs at about 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Their fresh new winter coat is built to trap heat in harsher weather, which is great for January, but terrible for October. A deer's movement is governed by metabolism, thermoregulation, and energy efficiency, not just weather. Deer face a significant physiological challenge. Unlike humans, deer cannot rely on sweating to cool down. Instead, they pant and use adjustments in blood flow, microclimate selection, and reduced activity to regulate body heat. In the summer, heat isn't just trapped in the core. The body actually has built-in avenues to release it. Blood is shunted towards uninsulated extremities like their large, thin-skinned ears, their noses, and their lower legs, which sort of act as natural radiators. Warm blood flows through these areas, allowing heat to dissipate directly into the cooler air. The ears are particularly effective with their high surface area and dense network of blood vessels. Even small movements like flicking an ear or shifting posture can increase airflow over these surfaces, enhancing heat loss. As deer grow their winter coat, a dense layer of guard hairs and underfur insulates them from the cold, but it comes with a trade-off. That same insulation that keeps them warm also traps heat close to the body, blocking the natural cooling that extremities like ears, noses, and legs can provide. Even when blood flows to these radiator-like areas, the dense fur limits heat loss and air movement through the coat is minimal. The result is a system that's built to conserve warmth, not shed it which is why deer can be surprisingly sensitive to heat during fall days and why their movement is often restricted when temperatures rise. Add that to their digestive system's fermentation process and you can start to see why 70 degrees is the new 90. When a cold front arrives, the thermal gradient between their body and the air widens, which allows them to dissipate heat more efficiently. Their metabolic rate can normalize, circulation becomes more effective, and energy previously conserved for cooling can be redirected into general activity. When it's warm, deer simply can't afford to move much, not out of laziness, but because every step risks causing them to overheat. October brings some of the most dramatic temperature swings of the entire season, often caused by radiant heating and radiant cooling. This rapid change, the flip between heating and cooling, is what we feel as the temperature drops at sunset. And it's worth noting specifically for hill country, but even some flatter properties, that whenever this event takes place, that the sun rises and it starts heating the ground, it does so in kind of uneven patches. And I'll throw a graphic up now that kind of explains what I'm saying. In this example, you can see these areas that are black, they're being hit by the sun actively. Those are areas that are being heated up but everywhere else where it's cool they're still in shade and some of those locations will stay in shade until 10 or 11 a.m and in some cases all day long you don't have to sit around and wait on a cold front in october look for days with the largest gap between high and low temps or the sharpest evening drops cool mornings or a quick late evening bursts of radiant cooling can work just as well as a cold front It's uh, 5.45 a.m. and it's October 19th. Um, a cold front actually is moving in. So in theory, the deer are going to be moving pretty good. The 9 from yesterday is our subject again. And I just have to assume he's going to be up on his feet and kind of halfway acting like a lunatic. And this is the portion of this video that it, it's really difficult for some reason for me to explain it, and I feel like I almost contradict myself at times when I try to explain it, but essentially yesterday, where it was warm, whenever I showed up, he had already done his moving prior to that time frame, so technically he was pretty nocturnal in that time frame, whereas today, there's going to be cool temps all the way until 10 a.m., 11 a.m., somewhere in there, and because of that, and thanks to this cold front, he's going to be able to move for a much longer period of time during daylight. So once again, in theory, we're going to see a lot of movement out of him. He's going to be going and hitting scrapes, checking does, doing all the things that he really should be at this time frame versus bedded down on the side of a knob. So enough talking and let's go ahead and get out there. I'm already noticing that these deer are significantly more active today. I flew around and checked all of the other deer before searching for our subject. As expected, every deer was up on their feet. I located our subject at 6.20 a.m. He was already on his feet, around 40 yards from where he was bedded last night. He moved down this drainage into a clear cut and was actively making scrapes all along the way. Light finally came up a little bit more, and he stepped into the open, allowing me to video his entire process. In this case, he hits the scrape for 2 minutes and 41 seconds. 
he moves to the head of this drainage and walks up a subtle ridge to the north before dropping into the next drainage to the east. He walks out of the drainage and then makes another scrape up near this road and then starts showing behavior that something is nearby. He becomes very attentive and stares directly south while licking his nose to moisten it and help capture every bit of scent. Suddenly, he moves quickly in that direction and I realize he has a four-year-old mainframe 10 in the area with him. The four-year-old wasn't down for a fight and bumped out of the way. He moves up to the field edge, makes another scrape, browses around and scratches the ground for some acorns and then finally enters this field. There were two does on the south side of the field and he showed a lot of interest in them. He proceeds to make a scrape for the next two minutes and begins browsing around the food plot for a few more minutes before heading off and bedding back down. This single event helps shed light on the lull and nocturnal bucks while simultaneously validating cold fronts. So why does my research and comparable GPS collar studies not show a dramatic uptick in deer movement on cold fronts? I think it's been a bit of an oversight on my part. Cold fronts don't create a sudden surge of movement. It's really a reallocation of time, meaning cooler temps allow for deer to make their standard movements during different hours of the day. I'll put it another way. Their total distance traveled or net displacement doesn't really change. What changes is when they move. Moving into November, temperatures usually stay cool enough that deer can move comfortably throughout the day. They don't need a sudden burst of radiant cooling or a cold front to get up on their feet anymore. So in a sense, GPS color studies and my own data are technically correct. Cold fronts don't have much of an impact unless you pair them with warmer weather and the added insulation of a winter coat, which just happens to take place during October. So there is some truth to the October lull in nocturnal bucks to a sense, but I have never recorded a buck that didn't make a daylight move early at dawn or dusk. Sometimes it's so warm they only make a move at one or the other, and this is clearly due to reallocating their movement to the cooler portions of that day, which is almost always in the morning, unless of course there's a midday cold front that's moving through. This same principle applies to the rut time frame as well. The opening day of rifle season in my area had a high of 80 plus degrees. That morning though, it was 59 degrees and didn't hit 70 until 10 a.m. I heard well over 50 gunshots in my area just that morning. In the evening, it was 70 plus until the last 15 minutes of light, at which point deer finally began moving again and there were maybe two or three shots that I heard all evening. A lot of people correlate morning movement with rutting activity but daylight morning activity noticeably increases as soon as bachelor groups begin splitting. They begin using this time to browse, define their core area, check does, freshen scrapes, and sometimes explore beyond their home range. What looks like a mystery is really a fine-tuned system. Temperature, cover, food, energy management, social structures, microclimates, and even subtle human pressure all dictate when and where they move. When you start seeing deer as part of this ever-changing system, suddenly the patterns that once seemed random or impossible to predict make perfect sense. And that's when the October lull stops being a mystery. Because the truth is, deer are still moving. You just have to look at it through the right lens. I just recently posted my first Q&A on Patreon and it's around two hours long. If that's something you'd be interested in, I left a link in the description. Thanks guys.